hope. Many people are without hope this year. Uh, many people are without hope because they're looking at things that are short-sighted. It's not fulfilling what they think it should be. Some people at this time of the year think that they have this big to do at Christmas time that they'll have hope that it'll be a better life. We have a tendency to focus on shallow things. Find a reason to hope. I am still hoping that the Cleveland Indians win. That's very short sighted. <laughs> I think 1948 last time. Um, they even had hopes that the Ohio State Buckeye would win the national That hope was dashed yesterday. So, we need something to force us to True hope. There's a song that we sing at this time of year called Little Town of Bethlehem. And in that first line, it ends this way The hopes. Of all the years we met at the time. Hopes and fears. There's hope that there was a hope that was found that people were looking for the Messiah. Much of that hope was grounded in the book of Isaiah. There was a hope and there was also a fear. Fears of those who did not believe. Fears that you could come, as it's said, you could come with reward and recompense. So there was a sense of fear. When the Messiah comes, he would come and bring the judgment of God for those who did not believe. So as we look at that, as we look at the book of Isaiah, in this series, today we want to focus in on hope. How it's presented. Something that we need. And so as we focus in on an anticipation, okay? His birth probably took time someplace in our, our calendar would be sometime in September. So it was marked by somebody that came up with December 25th. Regardless of that, just throw that out. It's always right for us to celebrate the incarnation of Christ. Is it not? But he stepped into our world. Emmanuel, God with us, the fulfillment of the covenant that God made and kept repeating it and saying, I will be your God. And you will be my God. The epitome of that is Jesus Christ stepping into our world to save us from our sins. Father, thank you for this time around your word. Thank you for the comfort that you give to us in your word. Thank you for the challenges in your word. Lord, as we open your word, we are destitute of the ability to rest in ourselves. As we pray for the power of your spirit, bless in the preaching of your word, and as we hold to the promise that your word would not return to you void, but accomplish everything that you set it out to do, in our minds and our hearts, that we would take your word, receive your word, Receive the reproof, the rebuke, or the encouragement from the Lord. Help us, O God, to then live out your word as we leave from here. Come to you, praying that you would have mercy upon us in Jesus' name. Hope in the days of Isaiah. Well, what was it like in the days of Isaiah? Described in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light of those who dwell in the land of of deep darkness and then light is shown. Darkness. And it leaves a sense of lack of hope, right? Have you ever been in a real dark place? Uh, when you've been in those times, you're trying to grasp something. We try to keep our room as dark as possible. And the other night I woke up and I was walking to the restroom and boom, I ran right into the dresser. Is that what happened? That's what happens when you're walking in darkness. You don't know the way. Okay, well then he says, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. 
Isaiah is describing people who walk in darkness in the book of Isaiah. Now, one of the things I like about the book of Isaiah, that this is a trivial thing, so I'm going to say it, and, and, you know, this is not preaching the word necessarily, but it is about the word, okay? Isaiah, there are 66 chapters. There are 66 books of the Bible. You kind of like that. With Isaiah, is a, there's a break between chapter 39 and chapter 40 in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah 39 describes that when Hezekiah uh, tried to uh, he tried to pacify his own ego, uh, when after he had been sick and he got better, and he had some guests come from Babylon, and they came. Did, has you ever, have you ever done this when people come over to your house and kind of show them around the house? And, and some people, I've never been to somebody's house, they actually opened the closet. Look at this. Man, this is so good. All right. So this is what's going on. And, I, and Hezekiah not only opened the closets, he says, look at this gold. Look at this silver. And Isaiah went to him and said, you not go ahead. No, that's not King James Version. But that's what, that's what he was saying to him because he said, these people are going to come and take all of this wealth. That's how chapter 39 is. Okay, when he describes what's going to happen. It doesn't sound very nice, does it? When the book of Malachi, the 39th book of the Bible, it ends this way when he says that um, he's talking about the John the Baptist, as he called by name, but the prophet, he kind of says, come to the spirit of Elijah, he said, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest, watch this, I come and strike the land with a decree under destruction, of utter destruction. So there's a curse described at the end of the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, the 39th book. So chapter 40, or excuse me, the 40th book of the Bible is the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel. And the 40th chapter of Isaiah begins this way. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak ye comfort. Kind of them their warfare is over. Their iniquity is departed. The and they've received at the Lord's hand double for all their sins. What a beautiful presentation of the gospel. God says, I'll come to you. And when he says it twice, it's with strength. It's like bold, undermined. And God says, comfort my people. Speak comfortably to, to Jerusalem. Kind of them, the warfare is over. The war is over. Reconciliation has been made. That's what it says in the book of 2 Corinthians. We are ambassadors for Christ, saying, be reconciled to God. He is satisfied with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The warfare is over. The iniquity is pardoned. And we receive double at the hand of Double. Yes, he's pardoned our sin, but he's also given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when I look at Isaiah, I love preaching Isaiah. Quite frankly, when I was going through the various things, I just picked out Isaiah. You know, you can pick out any of them. It's good stuff. Okay, so we're looking at Isaiah chapter 40 today, and I'm, now I've outlined it this way. You'll notice in the outline that you have in your, in your worship folder is that we're looking at the gift of hope. And three verses, Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11. And the command of hope in verse 9, the reason for hope in verse 10, and the tales of hope in verse 11. We read Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, and lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with him. First of all, I just look at that first one I just call it. This is the command. Go up to the mountain, herald the good news. Say to the cities of Judah, the Lord God. I like the fact that it begins with Zion. We are studying uh, on our Thursday night Bible study at the present time. 
going through covenant theology, and we're looking this next week at the covenant that was given to David, or sometimes called in theological circles, the Davidic covenant. <laughs> okay, and it's about the kingdom. And part of that is it's all taken from the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7 when it's outlined, but there's much of a behind the scenes look at it. And first of all, the first blessing that David had is that there was a civil war going on between his people and Saul's people. David had been anointed king after Saul had rejected God, basically, and said, I'll just take the sacrifice myself. And so God rejected him as king. And Samuel went and anointed David as king. So there was a conflict there. So there was always a fighting between the people of Judah and the rest of the people of Israel because some of the line, people of Israel aligned with Saul, who was the king, and some people aligned with David. So there was an inner fighting, and then all of a sudden in 1 Samuel chapter 5, and some of the, before that, there was this ceasefire. And Saul's head man, Abner, came to David and said, it's not a fight. It's ended. It's... So they came together. They were the end of the civil war. There was peace in the land for the first time. Secondly, there was the peace in the land that also David, he had a desire to, to take the, right in the middle of the northern, what would end up being the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah, there was this place called Jerusalem. It was headed by the, they were owned by the Jebusites. And so it was a beautiful city. So David, inspired of God, was on it. And the Jebusites made fun of him and said, well, uh, the lame couldn't even take, you know, you were like, like the lame people. He couldn't take this city. They kind of poked fun at him and then he took it. It's called Zion. Then he had a desire, this is important, important, to bring the ark of God there, the worship of God. So, uh, remember the first time we did it in kind of a haphazard way that we thought it would be a good thing to have a cart, right? And they were pulling the cart, and the ark of the covenant was on the cart. He went over a, a rough terrain, and a guy named Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark. Boom. Um, no one did that. He struck dead. David was appalled at what happened. I'm sure that there were some Levites that later instructed him. David, people won't touch the ark. Even the Levites who were instructed to carry the ark didn't touch the ark. There were poles that they used in the darkness of cover. So he did that because he learned that when the ark was taken to a guy named uh, Obed-Edom, that cool name, anyway, he's taken to Obed-Edom and his house was blessed, right? And so they, I guess it's safe to take the ark. And so they took the ark, they took it to now the city of David. Jerusalem, and they established the tabernacle there. God was worshipped. Second Samuel seven, David has a desire to build the house of God. He wants a permanent structure. He made the statement. He said, "If I am living in a house of cedar, how does God? Why is he in a tent?" And so his desire was to build the house. And so he called the prophet Gad and said, "I have this desire to build a house for God." And Gad says, sounds like a good idea. Go for it. And then God spoke to, to Gad and said, not such a good idea. You go tell David, he will not build my house. But his son, in the meantime, David had, the, he was allowed to prepare for the, prepare for the building of the house, which he did in abundance. He was also allowed to help prepare the plans of the house. As God instructed him. Here's what God does. It's so cool. And God says, You will not build a house for me, but I will build a house for him. And the word for house also means dynasty. 
and the Davidic dynasty continue to the Son of God who was born into the world in the line of David. I said all that to just say Zion is a place for God's worship. It seems to signify God's people gathering to worship God. And so we find in Hebrews chapter 12 that you have come to Mount Zion to the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels, the festival gathering, the assembly of the firstborn, her enrolled in heaven. This is what Jesus referred to when he talked to the woman at the well who was a Samaritan. And she said, after he made the statement, said, uh, go call your husband. And she said, I have my husband. He said, you're right. You had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. And she said, you're a prophet. And then she said, you say we should worship at Jerusalem. And our people say we should not go over here, not Jerusalem. God. And Jesus speaks to her and says, The hour is coming. Now it's here. The true worshipers of God will not worship in this town or this one. But they will worship God in spirit and in truth. For he seeks those who worship him in spirit and truth. And so Hebrew says, You've come to Mount Zion. God's people. So then he says, There's, there's a sign here that true followers of God, they're worshiping. And he says, they're in Jerusalem, those are the people probably left behind at the time they were carried into captivity to Babylon. They were the poor of the land. But there's a promise to those people, the poor of the land. When it says in the book of Zephaniah, I will leave in the midst of you an afflicted and poor people, and they will trust in the name of the Lord. That's what God does. So there's a gathering. And he says, go up to the mountain. Go high to the mountain. In the book of Micah, there's a picture there of the people gathered to Mount Zion to be worshipers of God. He says, they will come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord be established in the highest of the mountains and be lifted up above the hills and the people shall flow to it. Notice, O Zion, herald of good news. In the book of Isaiah chapter 52, it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Excuse me, the book of Romans, it talks about the woes of Bring the gospel, publishes peace, it brings good news of happiness, it publishes salvation. It says to Zion, your God reigns. If you ever read Isaiah 52 in the book, in chapter 52, verse 10, it says, The Lord has laid bare his, his eyes on all the nations, and he's, he's laid bare his holy arm before the eyes of all nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You know what that means? As the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, it, is, it was a, an impossible task that men could never do to save his people from their sins. For God to be just and to justify. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ came, that's the equivalent of a strong man rolling up his sleeves. <laughs> Which, if you had somebody coming over to help you move, and you had a strong man say, who took my brother broke here, you know, he's a strong guy. I don't know. Would you, would you like to have him help you move? He doesn't have a business on the side. I'm not giving that. All right. But if he, if he came over, he saw the job would be done, and he started rolling up his sleeves. That's a good sign. Okay, this is the good news that's coming out of Zion. God rolled up his sleeves. Do this impossible task of saving us from our sins. All right. Um, the word to Jerusalem was lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up and fear not. Let me just run with that word, fear not, for a little bit, because Isaiah brings us a couple of what we find in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 41, I believe this is in your, your outline. For I, the Lord your God, hold you up, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I'm the one who helps you. All right, there's a reason not to fear, because God says, I'm the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, <laughs> you man of Israel. Uh, yeah. Fear not, because you're just a worm anyway, and you don't have the ability to help, but God says, I will help you. And then he says, I'm the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah 43, we like this because of words that follow, but just read, let me read, read this one. It says, now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you my name, you are mine. Boy, you want some encouragement this week? Read that verse. You need some encouragement? God says, you are mine. 
Because I redeemed you. I created you. I've called you. You're mine. In the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, before he was born, uh, you remember Joseph had a little trouble trying to understand what was going on with his fiance was pregnant and, he, and she assured him she had been faithful to virgin and he didn't know what to do and so the angel of the Lord came and said fear not Joseph take it you Mary which is your wife that, that which is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit of course the next words are you shall call his name Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins when Jesus was born, the word was fear not. Behold, I bring you good news, the great joy that's given to the shepherds. And let me just add one more, fear not. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, where John sees the now victorious Lord Jesus Christ who had died for our sins and was risen from the dead and he ascended on high. He returns to speak to John in a vision in the island of Patmos. And he sees him. Jesus, I am lifted up, and he falls at his feet as dead, and Jesus speaks to him by laying his hand on the right hand on his shoulder and saying, Fear not, John. I am he that lives and was dead. Well, I am alive for everyone. And I have the keys of death. I'm in control. All right. The message that it was supposed to bring here, this good news, was to say to the cities of Zion, or the Judah rather, behold your God. Hold your God. As we read from Isaiah, John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. We don't know what God was like. People didn't see God. The closest was with Moses. He didn't really get a glimpse of God, although he, he saw him from behind. Man couldn't see God and live. And so he saw a little bit of him. He saw his train fill the temple and, and he cried out, What was the young man among clean lips and the dwelling of the people among the clean lips? And my eyes fell the Lord. Jesus made him know. He says, No one has seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him know. Remember how did he make him know? Well, Jesus said, I do the works that my Father gave me to do. And when John had, John the Baptist had problems that he didn't understand, are you the one or should we look for another? And the word was, and tell John again, that the, that the blind received their sight, the lame walked, the lepers turned to It was exactly from Isaiah chapter 35 when it says that, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees of those who have had an anxious heart to be strong. Hold your God will come with vengeance and recompense. The eyes of the Lord will be, uh, uh, the eyes of the blind brother shall be open, the ears of the dead will stop, and the lame will leap like a deer in the tongue of the sin. Well, the message of hope is that Messiah would come. They were commanded to bring this message Behold your God. And behold, your God would be as Jesus stepped into the world, saying, Remember God's life. Now, not only was there a command, but there was the reason for hope when he said, Behold, the Lord will come with might, his arm will show the world for him. Comes to rule, as it says in Isaiah 41, we read, Say to Zion, Behold, here they are, I give to Jerusalem. Notice he says, I looked for someone to help, and there was no one there. So my own arm uh, brought salvation. And when he says, hold my servant whom I will hold, my chosen. He says, I put my spirit on him, and he'll bring justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud nor lift up his voice. In other words, he's not calling attention to himself. But what will he do? Bruce grief will not break. Faintly burning wick will not punish. Faithfully bring justice. Not grow faint and be discouraged when it's established. Justice in here. I'm going to deal with that in a moment. Come on, the book of Matthew. But first of all, we just go on to say, he says he comes with his report. What is his report? Among other things, the reward of hope. Listen to the words of John chapter 6. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, says Jesus, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all which he has given me, I should lose none. Isn't that, is that hope? Always been given to the Son, he, he says, I will lose nothing, but raise it up again in the last day. So 
Jesus said, split not your heart from trouble through his disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me, and in my Father's house there are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to a prayer place for you, if I go to prepare a place, I will come again for you, but where I am there, you may be also. It's hope. But there's also recompense, as Jesus said to those, I'm going away, you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Why I'm going to be man of hope and the reason for hope. Now we come to the details of hope. This is where I'd like to go. Last few minutes here. Listen to the words. He will tend his flock like a ship. Gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently be yours. Tend his shop, his flock. Hmm. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd does what? Lay down his life for the sheep. It's not about me, he says, it's about my sheep. I care about my sheep. That's why Paul would say in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And backing up, he says, look not every man on his own affairs, but also on the affairs of God. Jesus says, I, I give my life for the sheep. What are sheep like? Listen to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. All we like sheep have what? Not astray. We've turned everyone his own way. The Lord has laid on him. The iniquity of us all. What are we like? How we like sheep? <laughs> and the sheep are so dumb that if one goes over a cliff, they all go. They'll just follow. Right? And they're just kind of dumb animals. They're turning animals. And, and they know that the peak is over here, and they would feel like going over here, we just go over here. And why? Because they're not getting fed, and the feed is over here. Hmm. Are we ever like sheep? Yeah. We know what, what, how we should stay close to God and, and enjoy His presence, right? We understand that. But we do that in sense. Oh, we like sheep of God's strength. We've turned everyone to his own way. In other words, our lives are like a pinball. And the pinball was you. Turned everyone his own way. But here's the good news. The Lord laid on him. The iniquity of us all. Because all we like sheep who have gone astray never earn our salvation because we can't stay focused. And we don't have the ability to do that. As a matter of fact, we're always going the opposite way. Thank the Lord that He laid on him the iniquity. He is that shepherd. So in John chapter 10, he says this, the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you were the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Now listen to this, this statement when he says, but you, do not, you do not believe because you're not my sheep. On the other hand, says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they will never perish. And my Father which gave them me is greater than all men. No one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I am my Father. I want to deal with this next segment I call the Ten Shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them is you think sheep are helpless animals, lambs are even more so. You think sheep are wandering animals, lambs are even more imaginative. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> they look so innocent, don't they? Okay. That's what they're like. So what does the shepherd do? He gathers them. It's on. Carries them in his bosom. There was a um, time when, when Peter was received three questions from the Lord Jesus Christ after the resurrection. This is the Peter, this is the one that denied the Lord three times. So three times Jesus said, Do you love me? And the first response when Peter says, Yes, Lord, you know why I love you, he says, Feed my hands. The next time Peter says, I 
You know I love you, Lord. Tend my sheep. And the next word is feed my sheep. Tend to my bring up some scriptures to you. In John or Matthew chapter 18, it says, Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest of the heaven. Jesus used little children to say, here's what we do, here's what it's like. Helpless, defenseless, just trusting. He says, that's how you come to the kingdom. That's how you enter the kingdom of God. That's how you come before the throne of grace. Just trusting. Just humbly. Humble like a little child. In Matthew 18, verse 10, he says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. I believe it's children, but we're to come like children. And sometimes when you look at the growth and uh, the spirituality of, of, of many of God's people, they're like lambs. Some haven't grown very much. Even though some who have been Christians for years have really grown. That's not, a, a, that's not a condemnation. That's just how it is. We're all like lambs. And that's how we're supposed to come like little lambs to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, longing to be in his arms, right? Just longing to be close to him, be carried by him. So Jesus uses that analogy and he says, see, you don't despise one of these little ones. He also said, whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So when we're acting on behalf of Jesus, we care about the, the little ones of the flock. And it could be the children, which we have an obligation to do as covenant children in the church, but also the little ones. They have been Christians for years. They need a word of encouragement. They need someone to come beside them and help them. I believe that's why Jesus says, watch out. You know, don't cause one of these little ones to sin. I also want to notice the last phrase, and gently bring those who are with young. I believe that uh, that statement was taken <clears throat> from the book of Genesis when you recall that Jacob was going to meet Esau. Jacob had uh, multiplied blessings, right? Just you know, his children and grandchildren. And it was flocks and herds. And so he, he was heading back to the land of Canaan, and he heard that his brother was out to get him. So he spent the night wrestling with the Lord, Genesis 32. And part of that was that he uh, was going to meet Esau and separated his people so that one see if, if Esau got mad and killed one group they would preserve the other group thinking he got them all and then he met Esau face to face and Esau said I need to meet you back I'll protect you Jacob turned him down no one because Esau was a man of vigor and he said, what you'll do is you'll move too fast. You'll drive my flock too hard. Kill them. So a shepherd needs to know what the flock can do. And so from Isaiah chapter 42, Matthew quotes this about the Lord Jesus Christ. Among other things, I would just point out the words, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering flat, a smoldering wick he will not quench. A bruised reed. There's an old Puritan preacher by the name of Richard Sibbs. If you ever get an opportunity to read anything by Richard Sibbs, read it. It is really hard to read because normally when you find something by Richard Sibbs, the point type I think is about six. Uh, and they did that because uh, if you had a 12 point type, it would be like 400 pages. So if you shrink it down, you can make the point type really small. So sometimes you have to sit and magnify it. Secondly, he's a Puritan, and so there's like 20 points to each chapter. And, he, and by the way, this is his sermon. And his most popular of all writings is called The Bruce Reed. Where he preached a series of sermons on his effort. Martin Lloyd-Jones who himself suffered from spiritual depression. He said this is the best thing he ever, ever read. If you a chance to read it, it's worth your time. A 
rooster, a raise of rats, and the grass is bent because of the afflictions of life. You can't straighten it up. It has to come up by way of the sun shining. Many times God's children are afflicted under the burdens of life. And they're bent over. And some Christian comes up thinking they're going to do the right thing. And they say, straighten up and fly right. And they're wasted. And there are some who have deserved the faith as a result. Jesus, the tender, gentle shepherd, yeah. comes to him who is bent over. He says, My little lamb, let me gather to my arms. Let me tenderly minister to you. I'm not proud of you. The smoldering wick is that. There's a flame there, but it's almost going out. The afflictions have brought it. it just seems to have quenched the fire within. But the gentle, tender shepherd says, I will fan the flame with the gentleness of my spirit so that the flame will go back out. That's our shepherd. Come to me, Jesus says, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Join with me. I'm the one who's pulling this yoke. Just yoke up with me. I'm the one who's pulling it. I'll not go too fast for you. I'll not be too driving like a cowboy does cattle. I'm a shepherd. I'm the gentle shepherd that will lead you to the green pastures and the still water. Apostle Paul said, it's the hope of Israel at the end of this chain. Paul said, Jesus Christ is our hope. Peter says, we're caused to be born again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says that grace has taught you that we wait for the blessed hope that we're in the of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we think about the hope of the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament, we look back in the incarnation and so we celebrate the anticipation. We kind of join forces with those people in Jesus' day, looking for something good coming. And those in Isaiah's day, as we look back, we anticipate the incarnation. Jesus is present with us. But we have that blessing now. And here's what we anticipate, as Rick mentioned earlier. We anticipate his second. Where John says, Behold, what matter of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. It does not yet appear we shall be, but we know this, when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. How does John in that phrase? He that has this hope. If you have hope in a glorious future through Jesus Christ, he that has this hope purifies himself. He is his the hope that we have is in Jesus Christ, our glorious shepherd of the sheep. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and your word. Thank you for the, the good news that is Harold in Zion. Our God reigns. He comes with his reward of hope. He comes with recompense against those who have turned against him. He has come. He has saved his people from their sins, and he's coming back. And so, Father, as we just look at it, the glorious truth of the incarnation, what a wonderful blessing it is. We challenged to renew our hope. A hope for day-to-day -day living and a hope in the glorious future that's found in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus. Name.